And it really fits in beautifully with libraries and school libraries because the skill to learn how to use it is the skill of asking questions and generating sort of these these research questions in the form of prompts. And and so it's that that exact prompt construction that is so important for uh, making productive use of ChatGPT. It is absolutely 100% going to change the nature of work in this country and, and around the world. Hello, friends, and welcome to season six of the Future Ready Librarian podcast series, Leading from the Library. This is a podcast for all librarians wherever you are in your journey. It is filled with amazing guests, important topics, and engaging conversations that inspire, engage, and support all of us as future ready librarians. I am your host, Shannon McClintock Miller. I am the district teacher librarian at Van Meter Community School in Van Meter, Iowa, and I also serve as the Future Ready Librarian spokesperson. I have the pleasure of working within my library and school community and also with others around the country and world through Future Ready Librarian events, conferences, consulting, writing, and more. I am honored to bring these voices and the work of others to our podcast and to all of you. Today, I am so excited to welcome a friend of mine who we haven't seen each other for a long time. And I was so excited when Chris said that he would join me because he always has something very inspiring, very thought provoking, and someone that has a lot to share. When I was looking at what he was going to share today, there was a topic at the end that you also mentioned. And so I was very tempted to just have this be like a whole hour because you always have so many great things. But I am so happy to welcome Dr. Christopher Harris, and I call him Chris, to the show. So welcome, Chris. And let's just start by having you introduce yourself and tell us a little about what you do in the library world. Well, thank you. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Chris. Uh, so in the library world, I'm the director of the school library system for Genesee Valley BOCES. We are an educational services agency in Western New York that supports 22 small rural school districts, uh, which starts to sound impressive for a lot of you around the country that, that are dealing uh, with, with working in, in countywide school districts. We don't support 22 counties wide school districts. Our 22 small school districts have a total student population of about 20,000. So it's, it's not that big. Uh, so we are small and rural, but, but it's, it's a wonderful place. Uh, I have an amazing team here that, that's let us really focus on a lot, a lot of uh, you know, big picture items in school libraries. I'm also very honored to serve as a senior fellow uh, with the American Library Association for Youth Policy Issues, working with the Public Policy and Advocacy Office out of the Washington Office of ALA. Very cool. Yeah, I always am so impressed by all of the BOCI systems in New York. And here in Iowa, we have, we call them the area education agencies. And we're so lucky in Iowa, you guys are lucky in New York to have that great network. And the work that really was something that I have been following that Chris has been talking about online is the work through um, libraries and the National Leadership Grant. And so I am really excited to hear more about that today, Chris. Yeah, we uh, applied for and received a, a National Leadership Grant from the Institute of Museum and Library Services, IMLS. That's the federal agency that uh, provides, you know, support for, for libraries, uh, school libraries included, uh, as well as all of our wonderful museums. And so we, we were very excited to, to receive this grant that has really let us look at sort of the, the role of, of post-COVID school libraries, uh, you know, all the changes that happened during the pandemic and where we're going now in the future. Yeah, that's so interesting. And so as you work through that, how how did that look for you? I know that one thing that really like caught my attention too is you say here that using the day the librarians disappeared to tell the story of school librarianship. I want to know more about that. 
Yeah, so for the grant, we held our first national forum in May of 2022. Um, we, we gathered just incredible, incredible panelists from around the country. We had amazing keynotes. Um, and, and what we really wanted to do uh, first was, was address the elephant in the room uh, back in, in May of 2022, sort of in, in the early days of those book challenges and, and book banning issues. So we, we took our first day to address sort of information under attack. Um, but then the next two days of, of that, that first forum, we really looked at sort of recording the story of school libraries during the pandemic. What what changes did school libraries make in their place and their services and their programs? Um, what what did what did we as as people do to step up and and pivot to to meet those emerging needs in in our communities, and and there were incredible stories, um, just you know all kinds of different ways that the librarians stepped up. And I wanted to make sure we captured those that were recorded those for history because it was a it was a major moment in education, you know it was a time when when education you know really across the country and worldwide. Mm -hmm. hit the pause button and then restarted in a completely new mode of online learning. And school libraries really led the way in, in making that possible in many schools. One of the things we heard from that, though, is school librarians were doing all these amazing things, but school administration, teaching colleagues, parents, communities were first surprised that school libraries were able to do this and um, surprised that school libraries did this. And what we really you know, got from that is there's a ongoing lack of understanding about modern school libraries. You know, all, all these principals that were you know, shocked to discover that their school librarians knew how to use Chromebooks and could provide tech support and, and online learning support and had digital resources. What do you mean? They're not just books, you know? And, and so it really showed us that that was a critical issue that we needed to, as, as a community, as a profession, address that misunderstanding about school libraries. And I think that that misunderstanding about school libraries and libraries in general, it must be said, is one of the, the driving factors behind all of these book challenges. Um, you know, if you look at all the, the, the national survey data, the majority the, ma the vast majority of Americans have no time for, for these book bans. Uh, the vast majority think this is absolute craziness to be banning all of these books. But there's this very organized, very vocal, very loud, demanding, small group that is using these astroturf, these, these funded, you know, fake grassroots efforts um, to say that libraries have an agenda because they don't understand. Libraries don't have an agenda. Libraries have, have resources. We have stuff. It's up to you to, to decide how to use that. We needed to tell that story. Uh, and so we we worked with a national marketing firm. They they call themselves a culture design firm, which I think is a great way to put it. But let's be honest, they're they're a marketing firm. They're experts in helping identify what people are thinking and changing those thoughts, reframing those understandings, uh, developing new senses of culture. Uh, so the company's called Gaping Void, gapingvoid.com. I followed their work for many years as one of the sort of the influential online, you know, thinkers about culture and marketing and, and, and making changes. Um, it was fascinating. They have an incredible art style um, that goes back to uh, Hugh McLeod was one of the founders there. And so I, I sort of audaciously reached out to them and said, Hey, could you help us with this project to sort of reframe a, a countrywide understanding of school librarians. And so they created this ebook, The Day the Librarians Disappeared. And we we held a national listening session in October of 2022, um, brought librarians together online to really let gaping void hear from the librarians. Um, what what do you do? What are what are your your challenges that you face? 
What are the misunderstandings and misconceptions that we need to address? What's the value that you bring? What are our real deep-seated beliefs about school librarianship? And, and they took all of those and put them together in just this incredible ebook. I mean, absolutely amazing. And then the graphics are so cool. Um, just, just they they tell the story. You know, they they have this beautiful graphic at the beginning of the book that that really tells that. You know, we don't have an agenda. You you draw the line. You connect the dots. You pick the resources you want to access. We just have resources for everybody. And so we're really trying to to get that out there and let librarians know this is a totally free ebook. It's at the libraries.today website, which is that that is the website, each you know, https slash slash whatever libraries.today. Um, and you can download it. There, there's a link to a PDF, and it's all Creative Commons licensed uh, by the work Gaping Void did. And so it's you know a, a attribution, non-commercial, non-derivative. So you can't change the graphics. But you can print them as posters. You can put them on T-shirts. You can make mugs from them if you have a sublimation printer and a heat press. Um, you, you can share them with with everybody that needs to hear this message. And it's amazing. Well, and <clears throat> right now there are so many people, like in my state in Iowa, we have librarians marching today at noon, you know, at our Capitol and resources like this. We're so grateful for not only the work that you do, but also that we have something that you understand exactly what you said, like what libraries, what school libraries stand for all the amazing things that that can bring to our schools and that community. It's not just about the books that we have on the shelf. It's about the community that is built within our school libraries and what that brings to our communities. And that's the message, you know, every day I think of when I go to school or when I talk to librarians that we all need to do the best job we can to make sure those stories are being heard. And so this work is just so inspirational because of that. Yeah, it was uh, it was an amazing, you know, journey to, to work with Gaping Void the um the the lead for the project from gaping void side was kevin denton and he's actually a former teacher and former school principal um and so he he knew where we were going with this he he had a great librarian that that really helped him better understand what school libraries do and so he he was the perfect person to lead this project and uh, we're so grateful for them taking on this work and and helping us tell our story that's really cool it's neat that they have somebody too that, you know, that understood and, and has seen that because if you don't, like I start out every year, you know, telling my librarians or my teachers in my school, like even though I've worked with them now for almost 20 years. And so we we can't tell the story enough and we, we can't share the things that we do, you know, <clears throat> every year to school board members and to parents and even to our kids, you know, what our libraries mean to them. And I think that, you know, not only the first forum that you had, but it looks like you have one coming up too, that you're going to do more. Well, work. unfortunately it just passed, but luckily all of the videos we're recording, all the replays are online at libraries.today, the website. And yeah, we, we, we really wanted to focus in this second forum, um, looking ahead to the future looking forward, uh, growing forward together uh, as a profession. And so we, we spent a lot of time and, and had uh, great panelists, you know, really looking at how do we build a support network in our schools? How do we get administrators to understand what we do and what we're asking for? How do we work with our teachers? Um, there was a, we, we had an amazing school counselor on that panel that talked about, you know, reaching out to other, you know, non-classroom teachers. We love our classroom teachers, but they sometimes don't understand how different our role is. You know, we have so much more in common with the principal than we do with our classroom teacher colleagues in many ways. Um, and so finding those others like the, the counselor, um, the nurses, you know, the, the other special area teachers to really work together and build up this support network where we're speaking together. And then speaking actually with a collective voice, 
So we had a panel that, that looked at how do we reach out to, you know, parent groups that, that have, uh, you know, sprung up across the country to support books, reading, libraries, schools, because we're all under attack together. And parents realize this and want to help us. But we have to reach out to them. And we have to, to work on that speaking with a collective voice. Um, and it was an amazing forum. We, we had actually a, a welcome message from the librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, uh, keynote from, from David Lenkes and, and Julia Torres. Um, just, you know, and, and I have to give a special shout out to, to all the authors that sent in messages of support for us. Um, they they hear us. They they know that that we needed some some messages of support and love right now, and, and they delivered on this. Um, and, and also, if, if you get a chance, the the final panel of the forum uh, was called "Diversity on Both Sides of the Book," and absolutely, I mean, breathtaking, absolutely amazing. Uh, ALA president uh, was on there, um, author librarians, um, professor from uh, University of Washington High School, talking about how do we continue to push forward around diverse books, why it's so important that we're representing all of these types of stories in our libraries, and then what, what we can maybe do next to try and diversify the profession more. Wow, that sounds so neat. I, I can't wait to listen to that. I mean, I think that it's like you said, I just had the best um, recording, a podcast recording with one of my librarian friends in Harlingen, Texas, who does amazing work with their school counselor. And I think now more than ever, because of what we went through the last three years, we're seeing more and more of those partnerships and that support. And I have never had yeah. so many even parents come in and ask what they can do to help. And I think that there's so many doors being open for libraries and for librarians right now that it's it's such an exciting time to be a librarian. Challenging sometimes, but we have to turn that around to be, I like a good challenge. And so, but I think that <laughs> These kind of resources and these kind of stories are what are so helpful to all of us. It, you know, you, you make a great point. It, it is an exciting time to be a librarian because we are seeing a, a definitely renewed awareness of the importance of, of libraries and, and school libraries in particular. Um, but there, there is that need to educate. Mm -hmm. There's a need to, to, to really tell our story of, of what we do. Um, that that we're so much more as a place, as a as a space to connect with with students, uh, as a a you know a resource for for helping students find their their own stories and their own lives and in books. It's yeah, it's it's a challenge. I, I think you know that that's why I've been working on another project as well called We the Librarians uh, at, at We the Librarians .org. Just a little a little side thing because. You know, we had this amazing advisory panel, this national advisory panel for, for the grant. And um, one of the librarians on our advisory panel was just telling, she's in, in Florida, and she was just telling us of, of all the, you know, the, the horrible things, the, the hate mail she gets and, and, and the, the, all, all the, the laws being passed and just all the attacks. And, you know, I was sitting there on the, on the Zoom call and telling her, man, I, I wish there was more I could do. I, you know, if there's anything more I can do, tell me. I said, I, I know there isn't, but if there is, tell me. So, you know, I, I feel like I'm working on this grant project. I'm working with ALA. You know, I'm doing all this advocacy work nationally. I'm doing all this, you know, storytelling of, of what we do. I thought, you know, I, I can send you a, a, a nice note. I can send you a little letter, a handwritten note that says we, we we really appreciate you and support you. And, and she said, that would be amazing. And so we, um, we, we actually sent notes to all of all the librarians she works with in her county. And so the librarians that I work with here in, in my system, um, we, we got together and we wrote notes to, to all of the librarians down there. I went and printed off uh, a whole bunch of stickers 
Uh, Rosen Publishing, Roger Rosen, um, helped us with a logo for, for We the Librarians. And, um, and now they're actually helping with note cards. So if you go to wethelibrarians.org, they will send you a packet of note cards and stickers for you to send out to librarians just to say, we're in this together and we support you. Because, you know, our colleagues in, in so many states and a, unfortunately a growing number of states are going to be facing immense pressure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these, these attempts to criminalize reading, to criminalize, you know, sharing a book with students. I mean, we wish the kids would pick up books and read. I mean, come on. But, but we're, we're being criminalized. This act of, of introducing a kid to their next favorite book could be a felony. It's crazy. And, and so, look, we need to know, especially, you know, those of us in, in, in the, the bluer states. Now, we're still seeing book challenges here in rural western New York. But we also have more protections statewide that, that say we're not going to put up with this stuff. We know that our colleagues in other states are going to be forced under duress, under penalty of, of felony charges, are going to be forced to do things they don't want to do, like removing books, like not recommending stories, not putting up displays. Um, they, they don't want to do this. But, but under those types of penalties, that's a really hard thing to, to, to face. Uh, so we, we need to, to all stand together. They need to know that we're, we're still supporting them. We're not judging them. We're not angry with them, that, that we're all in this together. That's so neat. We, the librarians.org, right? Yes. I love that. That's my, my subtle attempt, um, between this and, and the libraries.today naming them. Shh. Don't tell the public libraries, but I'm trying to take back the word library just a little bit. Sometimes they, they say library, but they forget that they mean school librarian also. We're taking it back. <laughs> I love it. You're always, you just always make my day, Chris. Every time I talk to you, <laughs> my brain is just happy. So I, I just love that. And before we go, I do have to ask you, because at the end of what Chris wrote me today, he said, I'm happy to talk about chat GPT, which everyone oh. is wondering, including my own son, who is a senior, like, what is this going to mean for me as I go off to college in the fall? Yeah. So we have to I have to um, ask. Yeah, I, I. I recorded a, a workshop. I, I did a whole big workshop here in the region and recorded it and posted it online. Um, okay. So on my LinkedIn or, or Twitter, you can find links to a, there's a whole Dropbox folder. Uh, and I'll make sure I send you that link so you can include it in the show notes. Uh, a whole Dropbox folder with all the slides up there, all the briefings I've done on, you know, for school librarians, school leaders. Uh, I'm working on more for teachers. Um, really just sort of looking at it. I think we're at an important, you know, crossroads. Um, you know, I, I came to school libraries from instructional technology world. Uh, I've been in school library world for almost 20 years now uh, as the director here. But but before that, I, I was in, in instructional technology. And so I lived through sort of the emergence of um, social media and sort of, you know, web 2.0 that those first the blogs the wikis the first interactive web content and schools blocked it they freaked out and they just they shut everything down and they blocked everything and we never talked about it we never talked about it and i i, I don't have any research to back this up completely but in in my gut i, I kind of think that because schools didn't talk about social media, we, we missed an opportunity to have a more educated, aware population. And, and you know, if, you, if, you, if I talk to principals now, it's so easy to get them to, to understand that we need to at least talk about chat GPT. Because if you ask them now, uh, you know, social media is the root of almost every disciplinary issue in schools today. 
it is driving so much of their time for principals. It drives them crazy how much they have to deal with stuff outside of school, in school, because it spills over on social media. But we never talked about it. We, we didn't teach kids how to be appropriate with it and use it. Instead, we, we blocked and pretended it didn't exist in the beginning. We can't do that with ChatGPT. It, n- number one, it's uh, even more so than, than 10 or 15 years ago. It is absolutely impossible to block this because the kids all have access at home. They have access in their, in their pockets. You know, it, it, it's out there. It's an interesting tool, but you need to understand how to use it. And it really fits in beautifully with libraries and school libraries because the skill to learn how to use it is the skill of asking questions and generating sort of these these research questions in the form of prompts. And and so it's that that exact prompt construction that is so important for uh, making productive use of ChatGPT. It is absolutely 100% going to change the nature of work in this country and and around the world. Um, And unlike, uh, you know, a lot of other technologies, uh, this is coming for white collar creative work. So think of like uh, copywriters, journalists, editors, um, but but even like lawyers, um, animators, graphic artists, you know, all all of those type of of low level creative work. You know, Seth Godin, uh, a, a marketing sort of expert, put it really well. I loved his his blog post on this. He said, look. AI is going to take over good enough. Good enough is now the realm of AI. If you want great, that's still human. Yeah. But if you're not working at great, AI is good enough. And, you know, I, I've been putting it to its paces. It's it's wrong about a lot of things. You still, you can't abdicate your professional responsibility. I, I use it to, to you know... Uh, flesh out just quick lesson plan ideas and, and things like that, but then you have to check them. It will very confidently tell you that as of, uh, you know, whatever date, March 7th, 2023, when we're recording this, uh, Boris Johnson is the current prime minister of the United Kingdom. We'll very confidently tell you that because the training cutoff date was 2021. Um, so, so there are a lot of things, but, you know, there, there's a lot of interest and this is a chance for school librarians to step up because everybody's talking about it in, in, you know, classrooms and uh, faculty meetings. I, I've been going out and just doing a tour of faculty meetings recently in local districts awesome. um, because administrators see that they, they need to understand this. So again, it's an opportunity for us to step up, play with it, understand it, and talk about productive uses uh, because it, it does, you know, like uh, photo math app and, and other apps like that, you know, talk to your math teachers. They, they already dealt with this. Um, they they had to change how they assess and assign math homework because photo math was the AI for completing all their math homework, basically, except for geometry, visual math. Um, but now it's coming for humanity. But if we show our social studies teachers, our, our ELA teachers, fascinating ways to use it. Um, I, I did a, a workshop for global studies, global history teachers. And I kind of did this like take on Bill and Ted's excellent adventure. And so, well, you know, because it has all of the writing from all of these historical figures in its data set, ChatGPT is able to, you know, create historical conversations that never happened. Like a letter from Napoleon to Hitler saying, dude, invading Russia in the winter, bad idea. Like what if Abraham Lincoln and, and Hammurabi talked about how the, the, the code of Hammurabi could apply to the U.S. Civil War. Um, I had to write a scene for me, an unreleased scene from the, the Bill and Ted movie about Bill and Ted actually going forward in future to meet with Greta Thunberg to try and convince her to go back to the past to address climate change before it got too bad. And, and Chad GPT had Greta Thunberg saying, I don't think that's how time travel works. Instead, we should organize and work together today because it's not too late and we need to work in the real solution to this problem. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I mean, just just incredible. Oh, but now, you know, yeah. those are things that that we can we can use it as teachers um, to really help us bring new ideas into the classroom that, you know, we, we could do them. But for me to create a, you know, that that accurate sort of conversation between Lincoln and Hammurabi, 
would take hours and hours of research, pulling out quotes, you know, deeply, I mean, probably years of research, let's be honest, to deeply understand and, and incorporate all of their writings. But the AI has them in its data set. And so it can do that and it can extrapolate from, from all the writings. So there are fascinating ways to use it. That is so cool. Now I just want to go to the link that you have and, and read and share and have you do a workshop with my teachers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, happy to. I love I'm trying it. to get back out and, and do more. You know, I, I haven't seen you for a while. I, I, I took a couple of years off there to, to get my doctorate because, you know, you, it's hard enough to work and get your doctorate, but work and get your doctorate and be out speaking and presenting was, I just, I knew it was going to be too much. So I had to put all of my work with ALA on pause and all my speaking on pause. And then just when I was coming back after I got my doctorate, then this little COVID thing happened. And so it's been a lot of years, but I'm, I'm so happy to get back out and, and talk and share. I love doing this. I oh. love going around and, you know, meeting everybody and, and sharing stories and, and uplifting, you know, I, I know I've, I've been doing this 20 years now. I'm, you know, I'm in the last third of my career. For me right now, it's about giving back and, and uplifting. Absolutely. That's what it's about. Oh, you're, and you're great at that, my friend. So where can everybody find you online? I'm horrible. I'm horrible at that. Um, I have a website, uh, playplaylearn.com that I, I, Every once in a while, I remember that I own and go update it. I'm really bad at social media because I'm not, uh, I, I know I'm not, I'm an outgoing, you know, like right now I'm in my, you know, speaker mode, but when I go home, I'm not an outgoing social person. Um, I've been trying to get better at using LinkedIn. So look for me on LinkedIn. Awesome. And reach, and we'll make sure in the notes to include <laughs> all of the information that Chris talked yeah. about because everybody's definitely going to want to know. <laughs> Sounds yeah. good. You're amazing, my friend. Thank you so much Thank you. for joining me. And I'm always inspired by everything that you have to share. It's a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. So you're going to be able to find Chris's information attached to this podcast, along with all of the resources that he spoke about too. Remember, there's also a certificate of professional development that you can download and fill out to use. As always, thank you to all of our listeners for joining us for this episode of the Future Ready Librarian podcast series, Leading from the Library. And a very special thank you to our sponsors, Follett. You make a difference in our libraries, schools, and within our lives and that of our students every day. We appreciate everything you do. I hope that you can take what you learned in today's podcast and put it to use within your practice as a future ready librarian. Until next time, friends, keep finding ways to lead within and from your library.